Well, I want, I want you to know, Church for All Nation family, how much I love your pastor, Mark, and his wife, Linda Coward. And you are so blessed right here. Join me in thanking the Lord for such tremendous pastors right here at Church for All Nation. Well, I have a PowerPoint that I will go through. And I tell people, you think of history as a continuation of the book of Acts, right? You have the book of Acts and you you talk about the early church and the struggles they go through. And so we're gonna sort of jump into one of the later chapters of the book of Acts. And you have Europe through the Middle Ages is Catholic. And then Islam invades. Uh, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. And by the way, uh, Islam enslaved over a one to two million Europeans and uh, they would raid the coasts of Italy and France and Spain, and there were entire Catholic orders during the Middle Ages called the Trinitarians, and the head of the order was called the Ransomer, and they would collect alms and donations at church services and then go under a white flag to North Africa to ransom your friend back who was captured you know, right off the coast of Italy or something. And, uh, and Islam's responsible for enslaving an estimated 180 million Africans. In Arabic, they have one word for African and slave. It's the same word, abid. So every black person they would call slave, slave, slave. And Muhammad was a white Arab that owned black slaves. Right? There are hadiths that says um, some people came to meet Muhammad and they said he's the white man reclining on the couch. And another hadith, a guy was on his donkey and it rubbed up against the prophet's donkey and he says, I saw the whiteness of the prophet's thigh. And there's another Muslim prayer, and, he's, and they said, I saw the prophet lift his arms, and I saw the whiteness of his armpits, right? And so Muhammad was a white Arab that owned black slaves. And so his followers did the, sl- the same, and they enslaved an estimated 180 million Africans. Anyway, as the Muslims were invading Spain, the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor, the King of Spain, uh, the Muslims were invading Europe, uh, the King of Spain tries to stop them, but then in the middle of it all, the Reformation starts with Martin Luther, 1517, so the king of Spain has a double dilemma. He's got the Protestant Reformation on one side and the Muslim invasion on the other side. And so um, he tries to stop both. Tries to squash the Reformation, tries to stop the Muslims, and he can't. And so in 1555, he decides he needs to make a deal with the Protestants. It's called the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. I took German in college. You know how to say 1555 in German? 1555. <laughs> A lot of fumf, fumf. Um, Now, this is an important treaty because this is the first treaty to officially recognize Protestants. And the king of England, I mean, the king of Spain would not have done it had not it been such a serious thing. And so in this treaty, he let there's a little Latin phrase, cuius regio, ius religio, which means whose is the reign, his is the religion. So look, Protestant king, believe whatever you want in your kingdom. Let's just work together against this Islamic invasion because they sort of want to kill us all. And so it it worked. It stopped the Islamic invasion. Um, But in the next century, uh, different kings decided to believe different things. And so it was this situation in Europe that each country had a king and uh, what the king believed, uh, the kingdom had to believe. And so in Northern Germany and Sweden, you had to be Lutheran. In Switzerland, Calvinist. In Scotland, Presbyterian. In Holland, Dutch Reformed. And Greece was Greek Orthodox. Russia was Russian Orthodox. Serbia was Serbian Orthodox. And Spain, Portugal, France, Austria, Italy, Poland remained Catholic, and England was Anglican. But again, if you did not believe the way your king did, you were persecuted and you fled. And so let's focus on England a little closer. There was a king named Henry VIII. He was married. Are you with me still? Um, uh, Henry VIII was married to Catherine of Aragon. She was the daughter of the king of Spain. And after 18 years, she does not have a son. So Henry decides to divorce her. The Pope won't recognize the divorce because she is, after all, the daughter of the most powerful guy in the world, the King of Spain. And in 1527, the King of Spain's army invaded Rome and imprisoned the Pope for six months. So the Pope's like, okay, I don't want to get on Spain's wrong side, so I'm not going to recognize King Henry's divorce from the daughter of the King of Spain. And Henry VIII says, you know what? 
um, I'm far enough away from England, uh, I'm just going to make myself my own pope. <laughs> right? So he, he marries uh, Anne Boleyn, and he makes himself the head of the Anglican Church, the Church of England. And you have the Archbishop of Canterbury and the bishops and deaneries and vicars. And, and those that wouldn't switch with him, he had their heads chopped off, like Sir Thomas More. And um, anyway, uh, after a little while, he didn't like Anne Boleyn, and he ends up having six wives. Uh, their fates were divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. So Henry VIII was not a really nice guy to be married to. Uh, he, uh, anyways, sort of paranoid and... Um, he, was, he would show off his athletic ability, uh, and uh, back then, guys would show off their calves instead of their biceps, and uh, they'd wear these tight stockings, and, and he, he only ate meat. He thought vegetables and fruit were sissy food. And so every day, pork, beef, chicken, turkey, he ended up being 400 pounds, getting gout in his leg, and... Um, None of the doctors wanted to tell him that he needed his leg amputated. You tell him. No, 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 no. You tell him. <laughs> anyway, he, he dies. But before all that, <laughs> uh, before all that, his advisors suggested to him, King, if you're serious about breaking from Rome, you need to stop using that old Latin Bible. Get yourself an English Bible. The German princes have Martin Luther's German Bible. That helped them to break away. You need an English Bible. So he said, fine, get me one. Well, it just so happens that Henry VIII, a few years earlier, had William Tyndall burnt at the stake for translating the Bible into English. And William Tyndall's last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And so now it's a couple years later, he's doing this divorce thing. He wants an English Bible to solidify his break from Rome. And uh, they basically take William Tyndall's work, polish it up, they call it the Great Bible, and they... Um, uh, King Henry likes it, and he orders a copy of it put in every church in England. And uh, they, it was very expensive. It was um, chained to the pulpit because they didn't want anybody running off with it. It was so valuable. And, but this was the first time the common people in England could read the scriptures in their own English language. There were some other scholarly translations, but this was the first one the common people I mean, they would like rent time. Your time's up, it's my time. And they would like, you know, flip through. Okay, <laughs> you know, I mean, the people could read it. And, um, and so uh, the situation was the king was the head of the church. But then there were some people that actually read it and began to compare what's in the Bible to this king divorcing and beheading his wives. And so a group started that wanted to purify the Church of England and they were nicknamed the Puritans. Well, the king doesn't think he needs any purifying. He thinks he's fine just the way he is, and so he persecutes the Puritans. And then there's another group that said it's beyond hope of purifying. We are going to separate ourselves. And they would meet in barns and basements by candlelight. Uh, they call themselves separatists. We call them pilgrims. Now, there were lots of different groups, and some of them turned into Baptists, some of them turned into Congregationalists, some of them turned into Quakers, right? But they were all breaking away from the Anglican church. And so um, if you were a separatist, you fled, and, uh, and they were persecuted. So the king's attitude was this. Yes, you can finally read the Bible in your own language, but no, you still can't believe whatever you want. you got to believe what I tell you to believe. I'm the king. And so they passed the Act of Uniformity of Common Prayer. You do not make up your own prayers because you could make up one that's wrong. So we've written all the prayers that we can possibly think of down and put them in a book. It's called the Book of Common Prayer. You want to say a prayer, just open up to the right page and read the prayer. And um, if you were caught praying with people on your own, you were a criminal. And they would arrest you. And then they passed the Five Mile Act. If you were caught preaching within five miles of a town without approval of the king, you're a criminal. They'll arrest you. They passed the Conventicle Act. It comes from the word covenant, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst. And so you'd have these small groups, a lot of them in Scotland, and the police would bust in and arrest you if you had a meeting in your home, a Bible study prayer meeting, and you had not gotten approval of the government. They later changed the name of it to the Riot Act because they said, oh, you could be planning a riot. But they would arrest you and put you in jail where you die, like a January 6th type thing. They just lock you away without a trial, without a, and, um, and so they, uh, it got so serious, they called it the Riot Act, 
right? They'd, so that you'd have your little Bible study, the police would bust in, and they would pull out a piece of paper and read the riot act. It says, everyone must immediately disperse or we're going to put you in jail, you'll die. And so um, the king of England also banned coffee houses. Now we're getting serious. <laughs> right? Uh, and um, so uh, John Bunyan was arrested at this time because he had a Bible study of more than a you know, number of people. He spent 12 years in prison. As they're, as they're dragging him away, he says, better to be persecuted than be the persecutor. And he spent 12 years in jail. That's when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Another one was um, the Baptist founders. John Smith, John Merton, Thomas Hellwise. They founded the Baptist church. And um, Thomas Hellwise was arrested and he dies in the Newgate prison. Now, they didn't feed you in the Newgate prison. And they didn't give you blankets. And the windows of the cells were open to the air. So if it's cold outside, it's cold inside. And, um, and obviously, they didn't give you anything to write with. It wasn't like a Howard Johnson with a nice little letterhead and the pen in the drawer. And, uh, and so John Merton, he's one of the Baptist founders. They put him in the cell and they don't feed him. So a friend brings him some food and a bottle of milk. And uh, he, when the, instead of a cork, it had a wad of paper. And when nobody's around, he pulls out the paper, dips a splinter in the milk, and he writes out his pamphlets. And it dries, it's clear, because it's milk. And then he folds it up, puts it in the empty bottle, the guard takes it, his friend takes it home, unfolds it and holds it above a candle and the heat of the candle turns the milk brown and they can read what he wrote and they typeset and print his pamphlets. And they're like, how is he getting it out of the prison cell? <laughs> and so the early Baptists call it the milk of the word. And um, anyway, so uh, Thomas Hellwise, who died in the Newgate prison, writes, the king is a mortal man and not God, therefore he hath no power over the mortal soul of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them to set spiritual lords over them. If the king's people obey all humane laws made by the king, our lord the king can require no more. For men's religion to God is betwixt God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it, neither may the king be judged between God and man. And so this is this idea that, hey, I have a relationship with God and I don't need the government in between telling me what I'm supposed to believe and not believe. And then two centuries later in America, a Baptist named John Leland writes something similar. Every man must give account of himself to God, and therefore every man ought to be at liberty to serve God in a way that he can best reconcile with his conscience. If government can answer for individuals at the day of judgment, let men be controlled by it in religious matters. Otherwise, let men be free. In other words, if the government can stand there on the day of judgment and an answer for why you believe that, uh, you know, the uh, man and the woman and the marriage, you know, why you believe these things. If the government can be there on the day of judgment, fine, believe whatever the government tells you to believe. But if the government's not going to be there on the day of judgment, you are accountable to God for your own conscience. And so this is what Thomas Jefferson, in writing to the Danbury Baptist, he says, gentlemen, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God. Anyway, so the kings would persecute people and they'd flee and these pilgrims fled from England to Holland and then they fled from Holland and they were gonna go to Jamestown, which was a king-run colony. But they figured they're 3,000 miles away and they, the king won't notice them. They get blown off course, they land in Massachusetts and so they have to start their own colony which is great because they get more freedom of conscience. But it's interesting, the Virginia colony, uh, they had this ordinance. There shall be a uniformity in our church as near as may be to the canons in England. In other words, that there had to be a uniformity. You have to believe the way the government of England tells you to believe. Uh, they passed this uh, in 1609, Virginia. None be permitted to pass in any voyage into said country, but such as first shall have taken the oath of supremacy. What is the oath of supremacy? Well, I declare the King's Highness is the only supreme governor of this realm in all spiritual or ecclesiastical things. So you in Virginia had to believe that the King was the head of Christ's church on earth, right? And if you didn't, it was considered treason. And so the government was enforcing conscience. It was telling you what you had to believe. Could you imagine the government telling you how to believe? And... <laughs> now, um, 
I read through all these different old uh, laws. Here's a law. So the, the main crop uh, in, in Massachusetts, the pilgrims had beaver skins, and that was what they used to pay their debt. But in, in Virginia, they had tobacco. They actually thought tobacco was healthy for you, right? Where did it come from? Indians. Indians smoked tobacco, peace pipes, remember? And, uh, and the Indians were healthy, right? They were really, you know, fit and high metabolism. And so the, the, the people in Virginia were like, okay, Indians are healthy. Indians smoke peace pipes. Uh, smoking tobacco must make you healthy. And so they literally thought that smoking tobacco made you healthy. So this was a craze in England. Everybody wanted to smoke tobacco. Um, but it was the cash crop for Virginia. And so this was passed in 1624. Whosoever shall absent himself from divine service any Sunday without an allowable excuse shall forfeit a pound of tobacco. <laughs> hey, we, we missed you at church on Sunday. Uh, tobacco, <laughs> pay off. <laughs> anyway, so I put together a book. It's called um, Backfired, A Nation Born for Religious Tolerance No Longer Tolerates the Religion of Its Founders. And uh, I sort of trace. Uh, each colony in America was founded by a different Christian denomination. And so, remember Europe? Whatever the king believed, the kingdom had to believe. And if you didn't believe the way your king did, you fled. Well, some of those people fleeing were the ones that spilled over and founded colonies in America. And so, Virginia was founded by Anglicans. Massachusetts was founded by Puritans. Connecticut and New Hampshire were founded by Congregationalists. Rhode Island was founded by Baptists. New Netherlands, which became New York, was founded by the Dutch Reformed, right? In 1664, the British took it over. And, and then New Jersey and Delaware were originally founded by Swedish Lutherans. And, um, and so they were Lutheran. And then Maryland was founded by Catholics. And then North Carolina was founded, the, there were two, it was called the Carolinas, and they were Anglican. And... Um, and then South Carolina split away and it didn't want to be Anglican, just plain Protestant. Georgia was plain Protestant. And then Pennsylvania. Now, Pennsylvania was founded by William Penn, who had spent many months and years in prison in England because he was a Quaker. He was sort of like, you know, you had the Baptists that were being put in prison while well, the Quakers were put in prison. And so he spent time in the Tower of London. And um, when he gets out, he decides that he wants to start a colony and I, I get into it all in my book, Miracles in American History, but he wants to start a colony where um, there's freedom of conscience. Uh, and he's put in prison. They don't give him any writing instruments. And he, he asks for a pen and paper, a quill, you know, a little bottle of ink, and they think he's going to write an apology to the king. And instead he writes, no cross, no crown. He says, Christ's cross is Christ's way to Christ's crown. And he just, you know, it says... Um, that he's never going to budge from the, the concept of you having a personal relationship with God and that God is jealous for your conscience. And, um, and so he finally gets out. The, the king owed money to his dad, and William Penn said, instead of paying the money back, I, I'd like it in land. And the king is very generous and doesn't give him just a little bit of West Jersey or New Jersey or whatever. He gives him 45,000 square miles it's the makes William Penn Jr. the largest private non non royalty landowner in the world, and William Penn could have lived the rest of his life as a king in Pennsylvania, but instead he decides he's going to do a holy experiment. He's going to invite all the persecuted peoples of Europe to come over and live in his colony, even if they're not of the same denomination. This was like a, a brand new concept, right? So in Virginia, he had to be Anglican. In Massachusetts, you had to be Puritan. And, you know, New, New Netherlands, you had to be Dutch Reformed. Well, William Penn said, hey, let's, here's an experiment. Let's see if Christians of different denominations can live together in the same geographic area. Wow, what a novel idea. You mean you could actually live? Anyway, so William Penn says, no person who shall confess one almighty God to be creator, upholder, and ruler of the world shall in any case be molested or prejudiced for his or her conscientious persuasion or practice, but shall freely and fully enjoy his or her Christian liberty without interruption. William Penn said, force makes hypocrites. Tis persuasion only that makes converts. And in William Penn's Pennsylvania, they had the first 
anti-slavery petition in 1688, the Germantown petition, and in Pennsylvania was started the first anti-slavery society in America. And it was Anthony Benezet, a Quaker, and he taught black children to read, and then he wrote a book on the horrors of the slave trade, and it began to be read by the different founding fathers, and then he started the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, and guess who got to be the president of it? Ben Franklin. And Ben Franklin, after the Constitution, spends the rest of his life fighting to end slavery. And in 1790, Ben Franklin issues a petition to the U.S. Congress to get rid of slavery right now. But Georgia and South Carolina uh, said no, and it got shelved. How we wish they would have had courage to end it right then and there. Well, like Europe's one denomination per country, in most of colonial America, it was one denomination per colony. And the attitude was, if you don't like our denomination, fine, start your own colony, right, except for Pennsylvania. And so the colonial denominations didn't get along, but when the Revolutionary War started, they had to work together against the King of England. So the Revolutionary War starts, and they're like, look, we have to lay aside our differences to fight the king, otherwise none of us are going to have any freedom. And I think that's where we're at today. And I travel the country and I speak in lots of churches and I'm seeing churches of all kinds of different denominations. If they have a pastor that is willing to stand up and keep his church open and be willing to proclaim the gospel, then they don't care what other denominations they are. We're brothers. We're brothers in the trenches. We're going to fight together for the freedom of the gospel. It was like I was inspired by General Kurt Fuller's talk on Friday night to the locker room. And he talks about when you're in a battle, the first thing you have to understand is you're under attack, right? He says, you got to realize, we're, and we are under attack. And then the second thing is you find shelter. And the third thing is you start returning fire. And then you dominate the fire, and then you attack them, right? And so I think God is raising up people with courage. And, you know, Jesus had courage. His first sermon ended with them wanting to push him off a cliff, This is our loving Jesus, right? And then he finishes another sermon and it says they picked up rocks to stone him. (laughs) Another time they're trying to get him and it says he turned and walked through the crowd and got away from him. And um, he had backbone. To the prideful, he was tough as nails. To the humble, he was as loving as it could be. God resists the proud, he gives grace to the humble. That's why we humble ourselves when we come to God. And, uh, but then there's this George Whitfield, Great Awakening Revival. The country's united. We get free. After the revolution, the attitude changed to, we may not always agree on religion, but you were willing to fight and die for my freedom. I need to let you practice your faith. And so what happened was we began to tolerate each other. And at the time the Constitution was written, 98% of the country was Protestant Christian. Three million people, 98% Protestant. All the different denominations, Anglican, you know, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Quakers, you know, Congregationalists, but they were all different Christian Protestant denominations. I read through every state constitution. Nine of the original 13 state constitutions required office holders to be Protestant Christian to hold state office, right? Um, 1% of the country was Catholic. There were 30,000 Catholics in a country of 3 million people. And only, originally only three states had Catholics in them, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York. And then one-tenth of a percent of the country was Jewish. 3,000 Jews in a country of 3 million people. There's only seven synagogues in the whole country. We were a predominantly Protestant country, but a completely Judeo-Christian country. And um, then three states didn't require you to be a Protestant. All you had to do was just be a plain Christian. And then one state had zero religious requirements. Rhode Island founded by Baptists. And they said if you required someone to be a Christian, they could say they were just to get elected, and that would be hypocritical. And um, so uh, in history, I like to actually read the thing. I found out that when you can see it at the source, suddenly you have confidence. And so here's some of the sources. Your 1776 New Jersey Constitution, all persons professing a belief in the faith of any Protestant sect who shall demean themselves peacefully shall be capable of being elected. Georgia, representatives shall be chosen out of the residents of each county, and they shall be of the Protestant religion. South Carolina, the Christian Protestant religion, shall be deemed the established religion of this state. Massachusetts, legislature shall authorize and support maintenance of public Protestant teachers of piety, religion, and morality. New Hampshire, 
1784, no person shall be capable of being elected who is not of the Protestant religion. That was in effect in New Hampshire up until 1877. It was the states that created the federal government. And their big fear was the federal government was going to pick one denomination and make it the national one, which is what every country in Europe did. England picked the Anglican denomination. Scotland was Presbyterian. Holland was Dutch Reformed. And uh, Germany and Sweden were Lutheran. Switzerland was Calvinist. Italy, Spain, France, Austria, Poland, Catholic. Greece was Greek Orthodox. Russia was Russian Orthodox. Serbia was Serbian Orthodox. Romania was Romanian. It was one denomination per country. And that's the way the whole world was. And of course, the Ottoman Empire, it was, you know, Islam. It was one belief system per country. And the fear in America was that the federal government was going to be tempted to pick one Christian denomination and make it the national one. So they wanted to tie the federal government's hands up because each state wanted the freedom to keep their own version of Christianity. Does that make sense? It's sort of like somebody has, let's say, 13 kids and they're at work and they only have space for one picture of one kid. And they say, well, I don't want to show favor, so I'm not going to put any of them up. And then somebody walks in the office and they say, oh, he mustn't have any kids. He doesn't have any picture of his kids. Right? That's sort of like in America. They didn't want one denomination chosen as the national one, so they left religion out of the federal constitution. Somebody comes along and says, well, they didn't mention federal religion in the federal constitution. They must have hated religion. It's like, uh-uh, read the state constitutions. Right? I read through every one of them. And um, here's... Um, New Hampshire, 1784, morality, piety, grounded on evangelical principles. That word evangelical was in the New Hampshire Constitution up until 1968 when they changed it to high principles. And uh, so the Protestant teachers in Connecticut kept its colonial charter and um, it talks about free fruition of liberty, privileges, humanity, civility, Christianity, call for. Rhode Island kept its colonial charter, liberty and religious concernments rightly grounded on gospel principles. And, and then Delaware was a liberal state. All you had to do to hold office in Delaware was to make this declaration. I profess faith in God the Father, Jesus Christ, his only Son, the Holy Ghost, one God, bless forevermore. You say, that was liberal? Yeah, because you could be Protestant or Catholic and say that. All right, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then Ben Franklin signed this constitution. All you had to do to hold office was believe this. I believe in one God, creator and governor of the universe, and acknowledge the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. All you had to do was believe in the Bible to hold office, right? You not only had to lay your hand on the Bible to swear in office, you had to swear you believed in the Bible, right? And this was Ben Franklin signed that. Now, Virginia's constitution has this. It's the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, charity toward each other. Not Islamic, not Hindu, not Buddhist. Do you know this is still in Virginia's state constitution? And um, so in America, religions under each state jurisdiction and the states expanded religion at their own speeds. And so like a racetrack with 13 lanes, some states expanded religious tolerance faster and others slower. So some states said, hey, you can, you know, have a little more freedom, but Connecticut, New Hampshire had blue laws where everything was shut down on Sunday. And everybody knew this part of the country. George Washington, after he gets elected, is going on his tour through the colonies, or the new states, rather, and he's going through Connecticut. And um, he's in his carriage. It's a Sunday, and the sheriff stops the carriage. The president of the United States. What does George Washington do? Gets out of the carriage, goes to the nearest house, and says, I'm going to spend the day with you. And actually was at that house and they have like the little silver spoon that they ran and got so they could mix the tea for him, you know. And, and, uh, but Washington honored the state. But in Virginia, they didn't have the blue laws. It was rural, agricultural, and you had to travel like miles just to get to a church. And then in America, you have Irish Catholic immigrants in the early 1800s. The Irish potato famine. Millions of Irish Catholics die over there and millions died. They said if you were to put a cross in the ocean where they shoved a dead Irish person overboard, you'd have a string of white crosses all the way from Ireland to Philadelphia, New York, Boston. Anyway, they fled into America, and the Catholic percentage in America goes from 1% to 20% in a decade. Wow! And there's a backlash. And um, they begin to put laws on the books to discriminate against Catholics, and I'll get into that. Um, but some states began to accommodate them. And so North Carolina changed its constitution. Its 1776 version says, no person who shall deny the being of God or the truth of the Protestant religion. Well, in 1835, they changed it to Christian, 
right? So just one word change, what, what difference does that make? That means Catholics can hold office. And um, anyway, then there's a persecution of Jews in Bavaria, and they come across, and the Jewish population goes from a tenth of a percent to one percent. And so states accommodate them like Maryland. This was the original Maryland Constitution. No other tests required than oath to the state and a declaration of belief in the Christian religion. But in 1851, they added, and if the party shall profess to be a Jew, the declaration shall be of a belief in a future state of rewards and punishments. So you could hold office in Maryland in 1851 if you were a Christian or a Jew. Um, New York's constitution, you had freedom of religion as long as it didn't excuse acts of licentiousness. What's licentiousness? It's sexual immorality. And it's sort of funny because it's now flipped where they're wanting to cancel you unless you embrace this unrestrained sexual stuff. And um, so uh, you get the basic idea of it. Um, but religion was under state's jurisdiction, not federal. Here's the Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story. The whole power over the subject of religion is left exclusively to state governments to be acted on according to their own sense of justice and the state constitutions, which we just read. And um, so some states today... Legalized marijuana, others don't. Some states have smoking bans, others don't. Some states have gambling, others don't. Some states ban big gulps, right, in <laughs> New York. Um, some states have prostitution, Nevada, thank God the rest don't. Back at the time of the founding, some states allowed a little more religious freedom. William Penn's Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Baptist, and so forth. And other states didn't, and they were really, really strict. But you see, like a drop a pebble in the pond, the ripples go out. In America, first, it was tolerance for the denomination that started the colony. And then the tolerance went out to Protestants. And then the tolerance went out to Catholics. Then the tolerance went out to liberal and new denominations. Then it went out to Jews. Then it went out to monotheists. Then it went out to atheists. And then finally went out to the LGBT and the Islamists. And the last ones in want to kick the first ones out. So it's backfired. Everybody's tolerated in America except the believers, the people that had the Christian views that started the country. It's like two magnets stuck together and one of them turns. It's sort of hard to pull the magnets apart. It's sort of hard to turn it. Then it gets a little easier to turn it, easier, easier, until finally the backsides of the magnets face and what happens? They repel, right? It was real hard for those Puritans to tolerate other Protestants and Quakers. It was real hard for the Protestants to tolerate Catholics. But then pretty soon they're getting to tolerate the Jews. It gets easier and easier and finally it's turned so much that everybody's tolerated except the Christians that started the whole thing off. And, um, and so it's, um, I use the illustration of Christians gave tolerance to non-Christians. So America was not follow, founded by atheists trying to figure out how to tolerate non-atheists. It wasn't founded by Muslims trying to figure out how to tolerate non-Muslims. America was founded by Christians that didn't get along. And they learned how to tolerate each other. And then the ripples went out to all the rest. And uh, I, I mentioned it in the first service, but another way of explaining it is imagine you're in your house, you look out the window and see a street person and you bring him in, give him a meal. They don't have a place to stay, you let him sleep on the couch. You wake up and there's two people on the couch. He let his friend in. It's like, okay, well, I'm late for work. You come back from work and there's six people, there's a half dozen and they're helping themselves to the icebox. And you're like, well, okay. The next day you come back and your house is packed. And you're going through the crowd, and they look at you, and they say, who's this person? We don't recognize you. And they shove you out on your front lawn. And you're looking back at your house saying, uh, what just happened? Right? So you had the Puritans, and they let in some of these other Protestants, and then they let in the Catholics, and they let in the Jews, and they're letting everybody else. So finally, they let in the Islamists and the Sharia and the LGBTQ, and they're shoving the Christians out. And we're like, uh, what just happened to our country? Now, why is it important to know this? Because they want to accuse you of being intolerant. You Christians are intolerant. And you need to stop and say, uh, excuse me, we're the ones that came up with the idea, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, anyway, so now why in the world would Christians want to let non-Christians into the country? I mean, if, if the Christians founded it, why would they let them in, right? In, in Sharia Muslim countries, they're not wanting to recruit in non-Muslims. Why, why would, Amer and so there's three reasons. One, they were following Jesus' example and Jesus never forced anyone to believe in him so we shouldn't, right? It's pretty simple. We're followers of Jesus. Jesus, here's Jesus, the son of God, and he never forced anybody to follow him. You know, you, you read the story of um, Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes and had a crowd following him for a free lunch. And, he, and they, were, they were wanting to make him king. And he knew this was not God's way. This is materialistic, right? They want materialistic food and they want to make a materialistic king. And he goes, this isn't the way. And he, and he can't just like say, no, no, no go home. And so he, he says, I'm the bread of life. Unless you, eat, you know, eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part in me. He must have known it would be difficult for them to understand it. 
And lo and behold, a bunch of them say, this is a difficult saying, who can bear it? And they turn and leave. Jesus didn't run after them and say, oh, oh, you misunderstood me, come back. He didn't run after them with a sword and say, get back here or I'll chop your head off. No, he turns to Peter and says, you want to go too? There's the door. And Peter said, you're the only one with the words of eternal life. My mind does not understand what you said, but my heart knows you're the Christ. Sometimes we get to that place where we don't understand, but our heart knows. And so since Jesus never forced, why is that? Because Jesus says in Psalms 110, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. He only wants, that those, he only wants those to follow him that want to follow him. He doesn't want you to follow him because you're afraid the king's going to take you out and back and chop your head off. No, he only wants those to follow him that want to follow him. I mean, if you're, in, if you're God and you have heaven and you want to populate heaven, wouldn't you want the people to be there that want to be there? You know, so free will is the big thing God's going for. And then number two, um, Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. A lot of the people were persecuted in Europe and they fled to America and they said, well, I don't want to be persecuted anymore and so I'm not going to persecute other people, right? And so this was them wanting to live that. And then the third thing I thought is the most interesting and it is evangelism. So do you know when the first missionary was sent out from America over to the Far East? It was 1812, Adoniram Judson went, went, was a Baptist and he went to Rangoon, Burma. That's 1812. Prior to 1812, if Christians in America wanted to fulfill the Great Commission, the thought of going to another part of the world, risking pirates, risking storms, risking diseases, learning another language, never seeing your family again, that thought had not entered their mind. They were like preoccupied with breaking away from the king. And so the thought of fulfilling the Great Commission was basically, let them come here. I mean, if there's only 1% Jew in the country, they probably thought, you know, maybe once in your lifetime you'll meet somebody that's, that's not a Christian, right? So just let them in and do neighborhood evangelism. And I love the, the neighborhood adopting plan that Pastor Mark and Calvin are, are doing, adopting your street, right? And so that was the attitude, was let them come here and love on them and bring them into the kingdom. And so prior to 1812, that was the attitude. And so they wanted to let non-Christians into America so they could fulfill the Great Commission. And um, anyway, uh, so unfortunately, the beneficiaries of Christian tolerance are now becoming tolerant of Christians, right? So the Christians let everybody else come into the country, right? I mean, in Pakistan, they're not inviting non-Muslims into Pakistan, right? Uh, North Korea is not inviting, you know, people that don't believe that idea. Oh, come over here to, North, to no. It was Christians in America that invited them in so they could love them and bring them to the gospel. And now they had a big fear that the federal government would become too powerful. Could you imagine people being afraid that the federal government would get too powerful? And so they passed the Constitution, um, but then they passed a Bill of Rights. And we've a lot of people will memorize the preamble to the Constitution. Did you know there's a preamble to the Bill of Rights? And this is what it says. The states, at the time of their adopting the Constitution, expressed, expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its power that further declaratory or restrictive clauses should be added. In other words, they're afraid the federal government's going to abuse its power, so we need to restrict it. And so the first 10 amendments were handcuffs on the federal government. The First Amendment. Oh, separation of church and state, First Amendment. Well, the First Amendment says what? Congress shall make no law. Who's limited by that? Uh, con the federal Congress. It doesn't limit the states and doesn't limit the churches and doesn't limit the, the coaches and the school teachers. It just limits the federal Congress. Um, New Hampshire was the ninth state to ratify the Constitution. It says Congress shall make no law touching religion. So in other words, when the subject of religion would come up in a federal setting, they're supposed to throw their hands up and say, we have no jurisdiction over religion. That's all under the state's jurisdiction. And um, Justice Stewart, 1963, Abington Township case, the First Amendment was adopted solely as a limitation on the newly created national government. The Establishment Clause was primarily an attempt to ensure that Congress not only would be powerless to establish a national church, but would also be unable to interfere with existing state establishments. So the First Amendment, First Ten Amendments are handcuffs on the federal monster. And um, so purpose of the First Amendment, prevent a 
federal government from picking one denomination, which is what other countries did, and to uh, protect your rights of conscience. And that goes back to love. God loves you. We want you to love him back. But love, by definition, must be voluntary. Three things changed it. One was this Irish potato famine I mentioned. And during that, in the next was the 14th Amendment. And the next was the theory of evolution. I'm going through this quickly. So when the Irish potato famine came over, a lot of people didn't like Catholics. And so they passed these anti-Catholic laws called uh, anti-sectarian laws, which prohibited tax funds from going to Catholic schools. And um, they got these on the books. And the second was this 14th Amendment. What's that? Democrats in the Deep South passed Jim Crow laws after the Civil War, and they formed the KKK. And that, that was like the Antifa BLM type group back then. And, um, and so uh, the states in the South would not grant state citizenship to the freed slaves and would basically reinstitute slavery, calling it sharecropping. And if you uh, left the farm without permission, right, and they were wanting to reinstitute it, so a Republican in Congress named John Bingham of Ohio pushes through the 14th Amendment to force these southern states to give rights to the freed slaves. And uh, here's 1868, John Bingham says, I repel the suggestion that this amendment will take away from any state any right that belongs to it. So the 14th Amendment is different than the first 10. The first 10 amendments were the states putting handcuffs on the federal government, the 14th Amendment was the federal government putting handcuffs on the states, saying you can't discriminate against freed slaves and you can't do this, that. And so some people said, well, isn't this sort of like the federal government getting more power? And he said, no, no, that'll never happen. Well, that's sort of what happened because of this third part, and it's evolution. So middle 1800s, you have Darwin and his theory that species can evolve. And so a guy named Herbert Spencer says, well, maybe other things can evolve, like laws. And Herbert Spencer's the guy who coined the phrase survival of the fittest. And so a Harvard law professor, Christopher Columbus Langdale, came up with the idea of applying evolution to the legal process. And his disciple was Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who was put on the Supreme Court. And Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr.'s biographer said, biographer said, Holmes shook the little world of lawyers who saw that the law was given by God himself, immutable and eternal. Holmes Biographer goes on, Holmes changed the law into a constantly evolving thing, a response to the continually developing social environment. Prior to evolution, the Supreme Court justice would say, what did the founders intend? Let's stick to it. After evolution gets applied to the legal world, they call it case precedent theory of law, you just take the most recent case and you can evolve it little bit by little bit by little bit. And so now you have two types of justices on the Supreme Court, those that want to stick to the original meaning and those that could care less about the original meaning, they're pushing their agenda. And um, so Constitution means what the writers intended and the evolutionary one says the Constitution means what the judge decides. Now, I will say that the Constitution has a provision in it to evolve. It is called the amendment process. And you need a supermajority. Um, you need two-thirds of the states or two-thirds of the senators and congressmen vote to introduce an amendment. And then you need three-quarters of the states to ratify it. That is called a supermajority. You need lots and lots of people. Why? Because you want the amendment to reflect the will of the people. Right? Uh, 19th Amendment, allowing women to vote. That's a good idea, right? We can do amendments. We can do this thing. But what the judges want to do is they wanted to have it evolve in their courtroom all by themselves with one person. And so it's not the Supreme Court's job to evolve it. Does that make sense? And that's why we have a lot of problem with like uh, Elena Kagan. And she said, court decisions should reflect public opinion. If over time the court loses all connection with public sentiment and public uh, so forth. It's not the Supreme Court's job to, lose, to keep track with the public sentiment. It's the Congress's job to keep up with the public sentiment. The public votes in their congressmen and their representatives and senators, and we put a lot of effort into elections. We want our public sentiment reflected in the laws. It's not the Supreme Court's job to have it keep up with the public sentiment. Does that make sense? And... Um, uh, 
So we got these three things, Irish potato families, the anti-Catholic laws, 14th Amendment, the revolution. It all comes together with this guy, Hugo Black. He was put on the Supreme Court. He was a former KKK member, and um, he had never been a judge before, except one year as a police court judge. And um, he decides to take the, the control of religion away from the states and put it into the hands of the federal government. And it came with the 1947 Everson case. I know this is sort of legalese, but it is important for us to get it out because they're using this, this concept of separation of church and state to take away our freedoms. 1947, some Catholics, students, are getting bus rides to a Catholic school. And some of the Protestant states do not like Catholics. And so they say, no, you can't have tax money go for Catholics to go on bus rides to Catholic schools. And the, they pass this law. Well, it goes to the Supreme Court. And Hugo Black, Everson versus Board of Education, says, no, the bus rides get to continue, but from now on, federal Supreme Court's in charge of religion. We're going to take control of it away from the states. And this is the famous line that Hugo Black said. Establishment of religion clause of the First Amendment means at least this. Neither a state nor the federal government can set up a church. Neither can pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, prefer one, prefer one religion over the other. If he were to say the First Amendment means at least this, the federal government cannot set up a church. I'd say, you got it. But he says, neither a state. He, did he not read all those state constitutions that you and I just read? You know what? He didn't. He had never been a judge before, other than one year as a police court judge. He was a Democrat senator from Alabama. And his biographer, um, Daniel Dreisbach, quotes this. Hugo Black's biographer reported that the justice did not peruse the proceedings of the first Congress, which debated the First Amendment, until after Everson was decided. Somebody sends him a letter saying, well, you made this Everson decision. Um, did you read the debates of the, is that what the founders intended? He turns the letter over, writes, get me the debates of the first Congress, gives it to his clerk. Hugo Black had never read what you just read. And yet he made the decision of taking religion out of state jurisdiction, putting it under the federal, and now it's the way it is, right? And, but here is what Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story said in 1833. He founded Harvard Law School. Joseph Story said the real object of the First Amendment was not to countenance much less advance Mohammedism, Judaism, or infidelity by prostrating Christianity, but to exclude all rivalry among the different Christian sects. And I, my slide cut off there. So um, now in 1947, the Supreme Court takes religion away from the states. The Ethical Society wants to be considered a religion. And the uh, IRS says no. And the Supreme Court says ethical culture is now a religion. And then 1961, a guy wants to be a notary in Maryland, but he doesn't want to say, so help me God. And the state says you cannot be a notary. But Hugo Black, again, him, he adds something. He says, among religions in this country which do not teach what would generally be considered a belief in the existence of God are Buddhism, Taoism, ethical culture, and secular humanism. So now secular humanism is called a religion. And here's what uh, uh, Scalia said, in Torcaso v. Watkins, we did indeed refer to secular humanism as a religion. And then we got a draft dodger during the Vietnam War. He wants to claim religious conscientious objector status as an atheist. And the Supreme Court says no. I mean, sorry, the army says no. But then the Supreme Court says the test of religious belief is whether it is a sincere and meaningful belief occupying in the life of its possessor a place parallel to that filled by the God of those admittedly qualified for the exemption. And then another draft dodger, Welsh, and the Supreme Court says conscientious objection to war is religious if this opposition stems from beliefs about what is right and wrong, and these beliefs are held with the strength of traditional religious convictions. So in other words, all you have to do is have beliefs of what you think is right and what you think is wrong, and you're religious. And then we flat out come with this case. A prisoner named um, Kaufman wants to have a atheist Bible study or a non-Bible study to Bible study in prison. He also wanted pornography. They wouldn't give it to him. And uh, the federal judge says this. He gets to have his little room for his little non-Bible study, Bible study. The federal judge says atheism is indeed a form of religion. The court has adopted a broad definition of religion that includes non-theistic and atheistic beliefs. Atheism is Kaufman's religion, even though it expressly rejects a belief in a supreme being. So when those atheists say, we got to get rid of religion, we got to get rid of God, it's like, yeah, uh, let's start with getting rid of your religion. <laughs> Right? And so when they say, well, we got to get rid of all, when they get rid of God, 
They are effectively establishing the religion of atheism and they're violating the First Amendment, right? They're establishing a religion. And um, so, over time, brilliant legal minds have twisted Jefferson's words to prohibit what Jefferson believed. Jefferson wrote the Declaration where he said, all men are endowed by their creator. But the judge, John V. E. Jones, in this Kurt Miller decision, ruled that students could not be taught intelligent design. They couldn't be taught that there was a creator. Why? To preserve the separation of church and state, which was Jefferson's phrase. So here they're taking Jefferson's phrase, separation of church and state, to prohibit the teaching of a creator, which Jefferson himself believed in, and he mentioned it in the Declaration. They're using Jefferson's words to prohibit what Jefferson believed. Wow, these lawyers are like so brilliant. How could they do that? And um, anyway, Jefferson himself, on the Jefferson Memorial, Washington, D.C., said, God who gave us life, gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. Anyway, in the few minutes left, our founders loved God. They had different denominations. They didn't always get along. We know what that's like. And... God said, I want you to work together so that you can break away from the king. And here we are today having to work together with other Christians that we may not totally agree with. Why? Because we want to save the country. We want to be able to teach the kids the gospel. We want to be able to pray in school. Right? I mean, here's the quote from, from Ronald Reagan. He said, in the last few decades, we've experienced an onslaught of such twisted logic that if Alice were visiting America, she might think she'd never left Wonderland. We're told that it somehow violates the rights of others to permit students in school who desire to pray to do so. Clearly, this infringes on the freedom of those who choose to pray. To prevent those who believe in God from expressing their faith is an outrage. Reagan said, the Constitution was never meant to prevent people from praying. Its declared purpose was to protect their freedom to pray. You know, I mentioned this at the end of the first service, and I don't have a lot of time, but please bear with me And if you heard it before. Um, why is all this important? I mean, let's take a moment and look at all this from God's point of view. I mean, he created the earth. He allowed America to come into existence. He allowed us to have freedom of conscience. He allowed us, and here we are today. Why, why is all this matter? From God's point of view, here's God. He exists for eternity. Eternity upon eternity. There never was a time when God did not exist. And he makes everything. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, omniscient, ever-present. He is incomprehensibly powerful. You know, he created light. And, uh... Einstein's theory of relativity is the closer you can travel approaching the speed of light, for you, time slows down. And theoretically, if you could travel the speed of light for you, time would stand still. God created light. He's obviously faster than light. So for God, time effectively stands still. Don't ask me to explain it. But it does say in the Bible that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Imagine experiencing one day as if it was a thousand years. I mean, we are moving like in super slow motion compared to God. So we make what we think is our little free will decision in the framework of God controlling time. So you get to make your decision. He can readjust every atom in the universe so that his will is going to take place on the earth. Right? And so uh, I put up this picture, but the Hubble telescope in 2003 focused on a little spot in the sky where there was nothing. Uh, It was so small, it was the size of a grain of sand held between your fingers at arm's length against the night sky. Teeny spot. After 11 days, they developed the image. And in that spot where there was nothing was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. This is the picture. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. And until the recent James Webb Telescope, this was the furthest picture that mankind has ever seen out in space. Every dot you see is a galaxy. And there's hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. And God made it all. What could you possibly offer a being that is so powerful? And light travels in waves with blue being the shortest and red being the longest. So they see the red shift and galaxies moving away from us. And they estimate that the observable universe is 93 billion light years across. And get this, still expanding at the speed of light. God is all powerful. What could you possibly offer him? What's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks. 
hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks, molten rocks. A rock cannot love you. So at some time in eternity past, God said, I've been there, done that. I can make everything. I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting. Because love, by definition, must be voluntary. The moment it is forced, it evaporates. If God were to force you to love him, he himself would know he's forcing you to love him, and he would know your response is not a love response. So he creates, so in this framework of everything he controls, time, matter, space, energy, he created one tiny thing he does not control, your will. Now, he could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made us different than everything else. He loves you. He wants you to love him back, but love by definition must be voluntary. He doesn't need your love. He's not incomplete in any way, and your love somehow completes him. He is complete all by himself. He doesn't need your love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. And the more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back, but he'll never force you. And then the second part of it is he, he has to hide himself behind his creation because if he ever revealed himself to you, being in the presence of a being that can create trillions of stars in his presence, your response, if you didn't melt, it would be immediate and instinctive like the apostle John, the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet, is dead. And God's not interested in instinctive responses. I can, he says, I can do that all eternity. I'm interested in this voluntary response. So he hides himself behind his creation. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself in all of his universe creating power, your free will's gone. And so the same hiding of himself that creates your free will necessitates that you have faith. I was thinking of a way of explaining it. Imagine a billionaire has a son who goes to college, flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini, gold rings, fancy clothes. An entourage follows him around campus. He's going to have every girl wanting to meet him. But if he lays that aside, drives up in an old clunker, got holes in his jeans, right, the uppity girls are going to ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library and eat together in the cafeteria. And they become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy. But she believes in him. They fall in love. They get engaged. And then he says, hey, I want to take you back to meet my dad. And they're like driving up to this castle mansion. The girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. God, Jesus laid aside his glory, came to earth, born in a manger, it says in Isaiah 53, there was nothing in his countenance that would make us want to desire. He only wants those that love him for him. So he hides himself behind his creation. But there's a third thing. God is still a just God. And he cannot help it. He is just. It is his nature through and through and through and through. He is just. He's a God of laws. Everything he creates, rules of planetary motion, laws of, of physics, laws of quantum mechanics. Everything's laws. He has laws for human behavior. We just have the choice as to whether or not to follow the laws. But he's a God of laws. And what does that mean? That means he's just. He has to judge every sin, even the smallest one, because if he does not judge a sin, by default, he's giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to sin, even the tiniest one, he's no longer a just God. He's giving consent to the sin. That means sin's okay with him. And if he's sin's okay with him, then he's no longer a just God. He denies his just nature. He denies himself. He ungods himself. He's kicked out of heaven. And he is not going to get kicked out of heaven. And he is not going to deny himself. And he is going to judge every sin. What does that mean? That means he could never be, he loves everything he created, but he could never be loved back. Because if he gave free will, and they stepped out of line, the just side would have to, he'd have to destroy us because if he didn't destroy us, he'd be giving consent and he'd be denying himself. Well, what about the angels? You know, I looked up the word uh, angel in the Bible. It appears 289 times in the King James Bible. Never once does it say the angels love God. The angels worship God, they praise God, they smite his enemies, they deliver his messages, they're ministers under the earth of salvation. But there's no verse 
that says the word love does not appear in the same verse where the word angel appears, but it's all through where man appears, men and women. And it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus rises from the dead and he tells Peter, Peter, do you love me? We are beings created for the purpose of loving God, but he has to give us free will, otherwise our love is not love. And so he could never be loved back because if something stepped out of line, he'd have to judge it, otherwise he's denying himself. So he has a plan. And the plan is his own son would become the lamb and take the judgment for all the sin. Jesus was sweating drops of blood in the garden. It says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Jesus experienced that day on the cross as if it was a thousand years. I book, read the book of Revelation. One thing seems clear. It's God that's pouring out the vials of judgment in the book of Revelation. Why is that? Well, this is the final judgment. It means he has to judge every sin he missed along the way. So you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there were these sins back then and you, and you never judged him. Were you were silent. Were you giving consent to there? Is there, is there a part of you that's unjust that I didn't know about? No, it says the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever and the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's gonna question for the rest of eternity that God judged sin. But in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. And if you think of it as a scale, I've mentioned it before, I have a degree in accounting, I like things to balance. An eternal being, Jesus, who's innocent, suffering for a finite period of time is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say it again, an eternal being who's innocent suffering for a finite limited period of time is equal to all of us finite limited beings who are guilty suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. Right? An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus literally suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places and he's the only one who could have done it and out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, he became the lamb. He took the judgment. And then he rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. This way, you and I can approach this universe-creating, omnipotent, all-powerful God who's completely just and not have to worry about being judged. Because we're approaching him through the lamb. So you can have the same experience with God the Father as Jesus, right? You can feel as comfortable in the presence of God the Father as Jesus is because Jesus is giving you his righteousness. You've got his name written on your forehead, right? And then he fills you with the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can reach out through you to a lost and dying world and share the love of God. So instead of you doing all kinds of good works, hoping to earn your favor with God. You're already accepted by God by, by the blood of the lamb. And it's his spirit reaching out through you to a lost and dying world. And his yoke is easy and his burden light. And it's actually fun. It's, there's nothing more fun than having the Holy Spirit work through you to minister to somebody. We get to participate in sharing God's love with the world. Thank you so much. God bless you.